its terrible familiarity, the Holocaust is merely one of a family of mass extermination campaigns in the 20th century. The age of extremes, as the eminent historian Eric Hobsbawm has described the 20th century, also has borne witness to Holocaust events in Armenia, beginning in 1914, East Timor in 1975, Cambodia in 1978, Rwanda in 1996, and the former Yugoslavia, which will be the subject of the final Holocaust Memorial Week lecture on Tuesday next week by Professor John Brown. There will be yet another lecture tomorrow evening, Holocaust survivor Al Wiener, same time here in this auditorium. Racial and ethnic cleansings with the aim to exterminate entire populations are by far the most well known of Holocaust events. Seen in a broad context, however, they are but the most extreme of a wider range of policies and laws enacted in many nations in the early 20th century. The intent of these policies was to segregate or to limit the reproduction of individuals the modern state deemed deviant or socially unfit. Advocates of eugenics, German scientists and intellectuals who believed that human and social qualities were biologically based demanded that governments actively promote a vision of purified generic heritage by castrating or sterilizing those convicted of such crimes, so-called as criminality, homosexuality, or deviance. Such policies became law in many states within the United States. Oregon was one such state. And it is to an Oregon story that we turn tonight a story quite different from the 19th century Oregon story about settling the Oregon Territory. This story concerns how a majority of Oregon citizens, some 783,000 by the 1920 census, enacted and carried out some of the most comprehensive eugenics laws in the United States, laws which persisted for half a century. It is a story that until recently historians have not investigated. We're extremely fortunate in having Mark Largent interpret these records and their broader significance, for he is an expert in the history of biology in modern America. After earning his BA in political science from Moorhead State University in Minnesota in 1992, Largent received an MA in African American history from the University of North Texas. It was there writing a thesis on scientific racism that Largent became interested in the history of science he then went on to earn his PhD in history for the program in history of science and technology at the University of Minnesota, working on the role of biologists in the progressive era. He came to Oregon State University as an assistant professor in history of science this past fall, and he's been enormously productive ever since. Largent is currently writing a book on the noted biologist Vernon Kellogg, The Rise of Modern American Science, where he argues that political participation was part of a strategy of professionalization for aspiring evolutionary biologists. And currently, he's also completing an article on the relationship of Luther Burbank and mainstream scientists in the United States. He serves also as editor of the Science and Society series for ABC Clio Publishers. He will be speaking tonight, it's no surprise, on eugenic sterilization in Oregon, 1909 to 1983 my colleague and my friend, Mark Largent. Thank you very much for coming. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to see so many students. Uh, I see a lot of my students, and you're all sitting in the exact same spot that you sit in my, uh, in my classroom. That, I'm afraid, is about the only humor in the story tonight. It's a, it's a pretty sobering tale. Before I begin, though, I'd like to thank Professor Dole for his very nice introduction and for his help on this talk. In addition, I'd like to thank the Holocaust Memorial Week Organizing Committee and the History Department at Oregon State University, uh, especially Professor Paul Farber and Professor Bill Robbins, as well as Tom Cook of the Gay and Lesbian Archives of the Pacific Northwest and Senator Cliff Trow and his staff for helping me access materials at the Oregon State Archives that I would not have otherwise been able to see. Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about the history of eugenic sterilization in Oregon. And when I use the term eugenic sterilization, I mean sterilization by various means 
of men and women, and I mean that the sterilizations were motivated or legitimated by concerns about the quality of the patient or inmate's potential offspring. I'll begin tonight's talk with a name that's familiar to many of you. Dr. Bethenia Owens Adair, Dare, excuse me. Bethenia Owens, which was her maiden name, was a pioneer settler to Oregon. Her family moved to Clatsop Plains near Astoria in 1843 when Bethenia was only three years old. She had an amazing life, which I'm sure that many of you learned about in high school or continue to learn about in college. By the time she was 18 years old, she had had a child, divorced her husband, won custody of the child, and resumed her maiden name, all by the time she was 18. Owen spent the majority of her 20s and 30s in school, first in a local public school, and then at a medical college called the Eclectic Medical College in Philadelphia. The college was later closed after the dean was convicted of selling bogus medical degrees. So in the late 1870s, Owens attended the University of Michigan, uh, Michigan Medical School, graduating in 1880, and returned to Portland to establish a very successful medical practice. She was one of the first women doctors in the United States, and probably the first woman doctor in the Pacific Northwest. In 1884, she married uh, Colonel John Adair, hyphenated in her last name, making it Owens Adair. And from the 1880s on, Dr. Owens Adair was a well-respected member of the social and medical communities in Portland. She was a leader in local progressive movements, which included temperance and women's suffrage. And Owens Adair was also a vocal proponent of eugenics. She devoted the last 20 years of her life to ensuring the passage of sterilization laws in Oregon and Washington. Using Owens Adair as a starting point, I'd like to explore the history of eugenic sterilization in Oregon. In doing so, my intention is not to hold her or any other individual responsible for the sterilization of thousands of Oregon citizens, many of whom were sterilized without their consent, nor do I want to denigrate her or their historical legacy or the state of Oregon generally. Just the opposite. I want to show you how incredibly popular eugenics was in the United States, and in doing so, demonstrate how eugenics was part of a broader progressive movement that attracted many of the nation's best known reformers. To do this, I'll begin by describing eugenics in Oregon, talking about Oregon's sterilization legislation from 1909 to 1935. Specifically, I'll look at acts that were passed in 1909, 1913, 1923, and 1935. These are not just singular events. This is a, a pattern of activity that went on in Oregon through the first half of the 20th century. Then I'll look at who was sterilized and ask why. And then look at the decline of eugenic sterilization in Oregon, which happened between 1967 and 1983, very late, according to the normal story of uh, eugenics. Then I'd like to try to put eugenic, uh, Oregon's eugenic legislation into a national context and then into an international context. And then finally, offer some conclusions about eugenics generally and the historical significance of Oregon's eugenic legislation. Let's begin, though, by returning to Dr. Owens Dare. She retired from practicing medicine in 1904, and she shifted her efforts into becoming the leading proponent for eugenic sterilization in Oregon. She believed, as did many of her contemporaries, that modern society was threatened by the rapidly growing number of people that they viewed as feeble-minded. Feeble-mindedness is a category that I'm going to use tonight, a category that they use and that I'll continue to use tonight. Know that that's not my terminology. In fact, most of the terminology that I'll use this evening isn't mine, which is why I want to rely on PowerPoint quite a bit. You'll see the words on the screen, usually with quotation marks around them. You know that these is, this is the terminology that they used. Feeble-mindedness refers to a class of people who are considered mentally deficient and therefore unable to resist inappropriate activities. These inappropriate activities um, came from a number of sources. Uh, they could be people who were insane, uh, people that we would consider mentally retarded, schizophrenic or epileptic. Sort of odd, we don't think of epilepsy as a uh, mental health disorder, but they did. Second group are habitual criminals. These are people who have been convicted of at least three different felonies. Uh, most of the legislation made that very clear. This couldn't be just a, a one-time event. It had to be three different felonies. And the people have been considered sexually deviant or in some way morally deviant. Uh, these were people who had been convicted of committing homosexual activities, rapists, or child molesters. 
Um, and you can see the way that these are grouped together. This, these are not our categories, obviously. Early 20th century social and political leaders were especially interested in ways that they could neutralize the threat they saw from the growing number of feeble-minded people in the United States. Owens of Dale argued that the most prudent course of action was to stop the feeble-minded from reproducing. For example, in a March 11, 1904 letter to the Oregonian, she wrote, the greatest curse of the race comes through our vicious criminal and insane classes, and to my mind, this is the element that should be dealt with, not by chloroform or strangulation, but by the science of surgery. For if their power to reproduce themselves were rendered null, a tremendous important step in advance would have been taken, not only with the injury to life, but often with the possible benefit to the victims themselves. She believed that eugenic sterilization was the humane course of action, and she contrasted it with the only other possible cure that she saw, execution. One can also clearly see the way in which Owens Adair's political and social interests melded with her professional status as a medical doctor. The science of surgery was her solution to the problem. It's very common in the history of eugenics to see historical figures, political and social interests merging with their professional aspirations. We often find medical doctors saying that surgery will cure social problems. Likewise, we find early 20th century biologists arguing that the new sciences of heredity and genetics could provide the cure for social problems. And at the same time, we find aspiring social scientists who argue that these complex problems could be solved through the application of their particular expertise. Being able to demonstrate that your field has useful social applications has been a common path for aspiring professionals to gain prestige. So for many medical doctors, like Owens Adair, eugenic sterilization was an excellent way to demonstrate how surgical techniques could solve social problems. Three years later, in 1907, she introduced the first eugenic sterilization bill to the Oregon State Legislature. The 1907 bill died on the legislative floor, but Owens Adair reintroduced it every new legislative session. By 1909, it was generally known as the Owens Adair Sterilization Bill. And while she was the chief proponent, it had several other powerful supporters. Chief among them was the Oregonian and its competitor, the Oregon Journal. Beginning in 1909, most people in the trumpeted eugenic sterilization as the solution to the state's problems with the feeble-minded, especially habitual criminals and rapists. Take, for example, a 1909 editorial in which the uh, editors argued that we breed criminals in this country and will probably continue to do so until Mrs. Dr. Owens Adair succeeds in getting her sterilization law in the books. 1909 was also the first year in which the Oregon State Legislature approved a sterilization measure. It was titled, An Act to Prevent the Procreation of Confirmed Criminals, Insane Persons, Idiots, Imbeciles, and Rapists, providing that superintendents and boards of managers of institutions where such persons are confined shall have the authority and are empowered to appoint a committee of experts consisting of two physicians to examine the mental condition of these inmates and to define who shall be deemed confirmed criminals within the provision of the act. The bill explained that if procreation was inadvisable and there was no probability of improvement in the mental condition, it shall be lawful for surgeons to perform such operation for the prevention of procreation. There is special emphasis placed on the fact that those subject to this new law had to be hopeless cases. The bill passed the Senate February 1st, 1909, 20 to 10, and it passed in the House two days later, excuse me, 16 days later, 50 to 5. However, it never became law. It was vetoed by Governor George Chamberlain. In a letter to the Senate, Chamberlain explained that he had vetoed the sterilization bill because it was not drawn to meet the conditions of institutional life in Oregon. He wrote, a bill departing so radically from established methods in Oregon ought to be skillfully framed and remove any ground for misunderstanding or misconstruction of its terms. Moreover, he said it was not, he was not entirely satisfied that the class named in the act ought to be submitted to such harsh treatment. If it is to become a law in this state, he explained, greater safeguards should be thrown around the unfortunate wards of the state who are mentioned in the act. Otherwise, he said, there might be a terrible abuse of power. Demonstrating the significant role that Owens Adair played in the passage of the bill, Governor Chamberlain wrote her a letter personally and explained his reasons. The Senate did not try to override the veto, and the 1909 bill died. While the bill was dead, the issue was not. 
In fact, the issue of eugenic sterilization grew increasingly popular in Oregon after the 1909 bill was vetoed. By 1910, notices of eugenic lectures that were presented in and around Portland were increasingly popular. For example, this one in 1912, in which Lorraine Helen Baker argued that human scrubs would be a thing of the past at a public lecture in Portland. She argued that we should sterilize certain types of criminals and insane, and there ought to be a medical examination for all applicants of, ma of marriage. She also explained that doing these things, we're doing nothing more than Luther Burbank and other naturalists have done with plants, and what is constantly being done with animal stock. Now, references like this one to the successes of plant and animal breeders were common in the early 20th century. By selectively breeding plants and animals, breeders like Burbank had achieved remarkable advances. Burbank alone was a celebrity in the early 20th century. Uh, the daisy, as you know it, is the Shasta daisy, and that's a Burbank creation, as is the potato that most of you eat, the Idaho potato. That's Burbank's creation. White blackberries, stoneless plums, spineless cactuses, dozens of new varieties of, po of poppies. This man turned out hundreds of new varieties. Breeders like Burbank were so successful with plants and animals, eugenicists believed that they could likewise improve the human race. Whereas Governor Chandler opposed the sterilization bill, one of his successors, Governor Oswald West, was a firm supporter in eugenic sterilization. Within a few months of taking office, West publicly stated, as I become a lot familiar with the conditions at the state penitentiary, the more I am convinced that the plan of sterilization as championed by Dr. Owens Adair is one of great merit. There is, he said, a class of criminal insane, moral degenerates, and moral perverts who cannot be reformed and never could be. These men fall under the provisions of the bill providing for the sterilization of the criminal insane, and such a man would not merely be a protection to society, but at the same time would prevent this class from reproducing its kind. <coughs> As politicians and the public were increasingly interested in eugenic sterilization, Dr. Owens Adair continued to press her sterilization law. And in 1913, the legislature again passed a law, although this one was slightly different from the 1909 bill. First, it covered a slightly different group of people. Instead of being directed against the insane habitual criminals and rapists, the 1913 law focused on habitual criminals and people considered sexual perverts and moral degenerates. The 1913 law placed increased emphasis on crimes of a sexual nature. It directed the superintendent of state institutions that held these people to submit their files to the State Board of Health and then to sterilize them if the board directed that action. And it moved quickly through the legislature. Being introduced on January 15th of 1913, it passed in the Senate 16 to 11, and then in the House 49 to 8, and Governor West signed it into law less than a month after it was first offered. Also unlike the 1909 bill, the 1913 sterilization law offered a few safeguards. For example, it did not apply to those convicted of rape by only circumstantial evidence. And the inmate could appeal the decision. One more issue of note, this law explicitly stated that it applied to both men and women. It was signed into law by Governor West, but it was immediately challenged by a state referendum, the referendum being sponsored by the Oregon Anti-Sterilization League. This league is very unique, and this is one of the things that first got me interested in Oregon eugenics. You see, there is no organized resistance anywhere in the United States, except in Portland. It's the only place that had an organized resistance against eugenic sterilization. The Portland Anti-Sterilization League was led by Laura Little, and Little is a great character. Uh, she absolutely hated medical doctors, and her rhetoric is a joy to read. Um, it's, it's, um, it's entertaining. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit in a second. As the historian Robert Johnson explained, she considered doctors to be little more than power and profit-hungry oppressors who, operating on faulty ideas, only made people sicker. Little's animosity toward the medical profession emanated from the death of her seven-year-old son in 1896. He had apparently died from a reaction to the smallpox vaccine. Some people did react to it and die. I found about 120 cases. It's very, very rare considering the number of people who were vaccinated. But it motivated Little, and from the 1890s through the 1920s, she led popular political movements against both compulsory vaccination and eugenic sterilization in North Dakota, Minnesota, and Oregon. And she attacked progressive reformers promoted, who promoted eugenics. She called them less constructive than a bull in a china shop. 
Here's, here's how she, she described them. She didn't call them progressive reformers. She called him them Mr. Sudden Reformer. Mr. Sudden Reformer, she said, sees something that he does not like in some of his fellow citizens. Very likely, this is a reprehensible thing, because plenty of evils exist in the lives and habits of all classes. But this would not be a particular thing of which Mr. Sudden Reformer himself is guilty. Therefore, he hates it with a mighty loathing. Dwelling on it, he works himself into a frenzy, and he would suppress, eradicate, exterminate, and stamp out that evil. Little American Sterilization League offered several specific objections to the 1913 law. They said that it was too loosely drawn, it could apply to far too many people, and that the act itself did not specify any particular operation. They were cutting off an arm or a leg or trepanning the skull would satisfy the requirements of this law. They argued that self sterilization operations would not alter the criminal tendencies of rapists and explain that sterilizing women would seriously endanger their lives, which it would. It was, a, it was a dangerous operation for women, a mortality rate of about 5%, which is very high for an elective surgery. They also believed that cutting out the generative organs directly affected the brain and it lessens the probability of a cure for the insane. It also they argued would reduce the mental power of the feeble minded whom the state is now seeking to raise in power by training and education. Finally, they argued that the claim that such a law is necessary to protect the future of the race is unfounded and wholly disproved by the history of penal colonies. They offered as example Virginia and Australia, both of which had been established as prison colonies and populated by what England considered to be its worst citizens. Today, the Anti-Sterilization League claimed both of these communities rank high in morals and vitality. Once again, the Argonian American Journal championed, excuse me, championed eugenic sterilization by printing summaries of eugenic lectures, arguments by pro-sterilization authorities, and editorials asserting the value of eugenic sterilization. For example, two days before the referendum, the Argonian printed an, um, a letter that argued that the intent of the sterilization legislation is to prevent low criminals and bestial men and women from propagating their species. And the opposition to this law is fostered upon a misconception of its terms, scope, and purposes, and is led by panicky, super sentimental individuals. Severe laws, they explained, to prevent the deterioration of breeds in horses and cattle are passed in force without protest. But laws for the protection of the human race are denounced as an invasion and inversion of human liberty. In the case of the, of the Oregonian, opposition to the special referendum was part of a larger resistance the paper offered to special referendums in general. For several days leading up to the vote, it featured editorial cartoons on the front page that urged readers to vote yes on all referendums so as to rebuke the abuse of the referendum. Uh, so Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, November 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, these are the three front page cartoons that appeared. Very obvious what the Oregonian wants you to, to vote. You see progress off on the horizon. Um, and if you look across there, um, starting on the left, it talks about the orphans. Um, one of the referendums was to cut funding for an orphanage. Uh, another one was to build the interstate highway bridge. Then there's the line rebuke the abuse. Uphold the university. University of Oregon had a, um, a funding bill that had gone up in a referendum. Vote yes. And then on the far right it says, um, uphold the workmen. That was a um, reference to a workers' compensation bill. There's no sterilization here on it at all. There's six things up. There's only five that they ever mention in any of their cartoons. Um, there it's carrying the referendum off to the grave. And uh, this is what it was the morning that you woke up to go vote. Um, all of nature telling you that yes is the right, right way to vote. They never talked about the sterilization bill. They told you to vote yes on all the referendums. In a um, editorial, they explained that the reason they didn't put it in their editorial cartoons is because it was a, delic a delicate subject. And uh, they didn't think that it was proper to put the sterilization bill in a cartoon on the front page. Clearly, they wanted you to vote yes on it. Uh, Oregon citizens voted yes on every single one of these referendums, except the sterilization bill. They voted it down, 53 to 41,000. So Oregon's first eugenic sterilization bill was vetoed in 1909. The second bill fell to a popular referendum in 1913. The 1917 sterilization bill fared much better than its predecessors. Titled, An Act to Prevent the Procreation of the Feeble-Minded, Insane, Epileptic, Habitual Criminals, Moral Degenerates, and Sexual Perverts, 
who may be in office of institutions maintained by public expense by authorizing and providing for the sterilization of persons with inferior hereditary potentialities. So included the mentally retarded, convicted criminals, and people described as moral degenerates and sexual perverts, it was by far the most encompassing law. Legislators stressed the differences between the 1917 bill and the previous 1913 bill that had been voted down. For example, State Senator Farrell argued that there's no similarity between this bill and the one voted down by the people four years ago except the word sterilization. This law is intended as a protective measure against the birth of idiotic and feeble-minded children. The people of Oregon have safeguarded the propagation of their fine horses and cattle. Why not do so much as much for the human family? The law created the State Board of Eugenics which was a completely unique institution. Not only was Oregon unique in that it had an anti-sterilization league, it's also unique in that it created an, an institution especially for eugenic sterilization. No other state did this. Instead, they would add the duties of eugenic sterilization to an existing board. Oregon had the State Board of Eugenics. In Oregon, superintendents of state hospitals and the warden of the state penitentiary would provide the board with a list of inmates whose potential offspring, because of inheritance of inferior or antisocial traits, would probably become a social menace or a ward of the state. And it defined moral degenerates or sexual perverts as those who are addicted to the practices of sodomy or the crime against nature or to other gross, bestial, and perverted sexual habits and practices. And like the 1913 law, it applied to both males and females. The 1917 law offered some safeguards for an inmate, though. Orders for the operation must be presented to the inmate or guardian. They could not just be hauled off and sterilized. And they could appeal their sterilization order to the county circuit court within 15 days. And the court would hear the evidence issued by the board and then issue a ruling. While the public was up in arms about the 1913 bill, there was little, if any, reaction to the 1917 bill. Why? By and large, the public's attention was focused on international concerns. The sterilization bill was signed in February of 1917, and if you remember, earlier that month, the United States had broken diplomatic relations with Germany, and within 60 days, the United States had entered World War I. So instead of featuring editorials and stories and cartoons about the sterilization bill, the Argonian and the Oregon Journal and the people of Oregon watched events in Europe. In fact, the 1917 bill never really came on the public's radar screen. It turns out this is precisely what the supporters of the bill wanted. Take, for example, the extract from this letter I'll show you from the Oregon State Health Officer, Dr. David Roberg, to Harry Laughlin in 1918. Laughlin, some of you may know, was the widely recognized authority and chief promoter of eugenic sterilization in the United States. And in addition to promoting sterilization laws, he kept track of their implementation by writing letters to, to state health officials. After explaining the state of eugenic sterilization in Oregon, Roberg explained to Laughlin, public sentiment has not been aroused and the work is moving smoothly. Public opinion was clearly on the minds of the proponents of eugenic sterilization. For example, in a letter between the member of the Board of Eugenics, Dr. Steiner, and Laughlin, Steiner wrote, it has been rather difficult for the public as well as for patients and relatives to get the right point of view and appreciate the immediate and remote benefits to be derived from this means of preventing the increase of insanity. But I think there is reason to hope that their increasing enlightenment will cause these operations to be resorted to much more extensively in the future. Four years after it was adopted, the 1917 sterilization law was challenged in Marion County Circuit Court. It was in a case brought by Jacob Klein. Klein's not a likable character. He was a father uh, in his mid-60s who lived near Glendale. He had been convicted of sexually abusing his 12-year-old adopted daughter and sentenced to four to ten years in prison as a moral pervert. As the 1917 law required, the prison warden had submitted Klein's name and record to the Board of Eugenics, who ruled that he should be sterilized. Klein appealed his case to the county circuit court, which ruled that the law was unconstitutional for three reasons. First, they said that it constituted class legislation because it pertained only to those people who were inmates of state institutions. Secondly, they said that coerced sterilization was cruel and unusual punishment. But most importantly, they said that the 1917 sterilization law violated due process of law because unless the subjects objected, they were sterilized without having their cases heard in court.
The Oregon State Legislature moved quickly to reinstate the law and overcome the legal problems that the court had identified. So in 1923, they passed a law titled, An Act to Provide for the Sterilization of All Feeble-Minded, Insane Epileptics, Habitual Criminals, Moral Degenerates, and Sex Perverts, Who Are a Menace to Society. The legislature slightly changed the process whereby someone would be ordered to be sterilized. Operations would be performed only if the concerned person consented, or in cases where they didn't consent, a court trial would be held to determine whether or not the person should be forcibly sterilized. The 1923 bill passed and signed, and sterilization returned to Oregon. Two years later, in 1925, the Oregon law was reinforced when the United States Supreme Court issued the infamous Buck v. Bell decision. In it, the court upheld the constitutionality of involuntary sterilization. I'm sure many of you have heard this. Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes argued that it's better for all of the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for their crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. And Holmes compared voluntary sterilization to compulsory vaccination. We can force you to be vaccinated. We should be able to force you to be sterilized. He concluded, the principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Mm. Oregon's 1923 eugenic sterilization law worked smoothly and quietly throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s. There was little, if any, public concern about the sterilization of prison inmates or state hospital patients. And in Oregon, there was very little public discussion about these things. This all changed in the 1930s. As the prosperous 1920s gave way to the Great Depression, Americans became increasingly concerned about the high costs of maintaining state prisons and mental health facilities. This is very apparent in Oregon. Whereas there are few stories in the Oregonian or the Oregon Journal promoting sterilization in the 20s, by 1935, they're quite common. And state officials begin making very aggressive public statements promoting eugenic sterilization as a solution to financial problems. For example, the state treasurer Rufus Holman argued on economic grounds that more sterilization was needed. What was keeping state officials from sterilizing these people? Well, that pesky 1923 law that required a patient's consent or a court order. Perhaps the most startling newspaper story from the era was a 1935 Oregon Journal story that read, seriously, taking a tip from Nazi Germany, Oregon today considered embarking on a far-reaching program of sterilization of its unfit citizens. Governor Martin declared that he would not pardon from the state penitentiary persons convicted of sex crimes unless the prisoners volunteer to submit to sterilization. The story went on, State Treasurer Rufus Holman and Secretary of State Earl Snell, members of the Board of Control, have discussed increased sterilization of inmates of penal and charitable institutions, and the Board is known to feel that the state must take more drastic steps to halt the increase in numbers of the criminally and mentally diseased persons who are responsible for an alarming growth in the population of these institutions. In 1935, the state legislature loosened the 1923 restrictions on involuntary sterilization. The 1935 amendments to the Oregon Eugenic Sterilization Law removed the need for patient consent, and it replaced it by giving the inmate the ability to sue to stop the sterilization. Within a year, Martin offered a plan to grant executive clemency to, to all Oregon State Penitentiary convicts who were sentenced for sex crimes if they volunteered to submit for sterilization. Newspaper reports that several men jumped at the chance to trade their reproductive abilities for their freedom. These sterilizations may seem voluntary, but there's clear ethical problems with offering prison inmates parole in exchange for sterilization. Who was sterilized? Why were they sterilized? And how were they sterilized? Broadly speaking, most people associate eugenics with racism. And in Oregon, eugenic sterilization was quite racist. Oregonians used sterilization to clean up the white race. By and large, it was an attempt to purge feeble-mindedness from the white race. Other historians have seen similar situations in other states, for example, in the American South. In Oregon, whites made up the vast majority of mental hospital patients, and therefore made up the majority of those who were sterilized in the 20s and 30s. 
The threat was not from other races, it was from feeble-minded whites. Instead of thinking of eugenics as white oppression over other races, I think it's probably more accurate to characterize it in Oregon and in the United States more generally as the dominance of the American middle class over lower classes. This has been an argument of the historian of biology, Gar Allen, who's he's championed it for a number of years, and it's one that I accept. The Oregon eugenic sterilization laws called for the sterilization of three general groups of people. Most of them ended up being lower class or recent white immigrants. They were all classified as feeble-minded. And the lower socioeconomic classes were disproportionately represented in all three of these groups. The first were those who were deemed insane. They were general patients housed in the state hospital in Salem or in Eastern Oregon State, you know, state Hospital in Pendleton. We have very, very accurate numbers for the, numbers, for the sterilizations that were performed in the Salem facility, but only in the Salem facility. This is an ugly chart, and I apologize for it. It's going to take you a minute to digest it. Down the left side of the years that sterilizations were active, I've got 1918 to 1941 are what we've got records for, and I've divided it between men and women, and then the operations that were used. If you look at the women, for example, salpicectomies are tubal ligations. Ovariotomies are removing the, um, the ovaries. Most of the women were given tubal ligations. The men, the vast majority, were castrated. This was not simple vasectomies. These men had their testicles removed. You're looking at about 60% of the population who were sterilized were women. About 40% were men. And of the men who were sterilized, the vast majority were castrated. Second group of people are habitual criminals. And I don't have very good records for the criminals who were sterilized um, under the heading of habitual criminal, somebody who had been convicted of at least three separate felonies. I have been able to get together a number of individual cases. And it appears that at least some of those sterilized were men in Oregon State Penitentiary who were castrated because of their activities within the penitentiary. You have to read between the lines a little bit here. Looking through the records of the Board of Eugenics, of which the Oregon State Archives has records from 1917 through 1920, we find specific references to the castration of particular prison inmates and explanations for the rationale of its use. At the first meeting, the warden, Charles Murphy, explained that sodomy was rampant in the prison, and the solution to the problem of sodomy in the prison was castration. The third group of people are moral degenerates and sexual perverts, uh, those who are deemed that. And this third class could be housed at either the state penitentiary or the Oregon State Hospitals. The historians Tom Cook and George Painter have very persuasively argued that the inmates who fell into these categories were generally men convicted of engaging homosexual acts. But the group also included men convicted of rape and child molestation. Likewise, in a recent Oregon Historical Quarterly, Peter Berg has emphasized the role of the 1912 same-sex vice scandal in Portland in encouraging uh, the sterilization legislation. In this way, we can portray the sterilization laws as motivated to some degree by concerns about male homosexuality. And this interpretation is further supported by the use of castration in most cases. Of the records I've been able to locate, over two-thirds of the prison inmates who were sterilized were castrated. Clearly, there's more going on here than simply removing these people from the gene pool. The vasectomy, a much less invasive surgery, was available and occasionally used, but it was much more common for the prisoners to be emasculated instead of merely sterilized. Through the 1920s and into the 30s, state mental health and prison authorities continued to sterilize inmates at a rate of about 60 a year. And these sterilizations were certainly not well publicized, although occasionally a story would hit the papers about a court case of a family member who was trying to stop the sterilization. Um, but generally, we see very, very little discussion of it. Oregon sterilization law remained on the books, and the Board of Eugenics continued to meet until late in the 1960s. In 1967, the legislature changed the name of the board from the Board of Eugenics to the Board of Social Protection. It also changed some of the procedures for the sterilization of inmates. For example, the board was no longer populated by superintendents of mental health and penal institutions. Instead, it would be made up of a physician, a faculty member from the University of, o of Oregon, a clinical psychologist, a psychiatrist, a social worker, 
and a member of a state organization on mental illness. The public defender would be sent copies of all sterilization notifications. The board had to subpoena the inmate to come before them, and the board had to specify the type of operation. It tightened things up a little bit. Moreover, the legislature stripped most of the eugenic language from the 1935 sterilization law, and it, it placed much more emphasis on the prospective parent's ability to take care of the children, not the quality of the children. They removed phrases like, having an inherited tendency to mental retardation or mental illness, or would probably become a social menace or ward of the state. Excuse me. And they removed protecting society from the menace of procreation by such persons. It's clear that by the 1960s, the only class of state wards who were considered for sterilization in Oregon were those patients of the state hospitals. No longer was it acceptable to sterilize rapists or persons defined as sex perverts or moral deviants. The change in the name of the Oregon State Board of Eugenics to the Oregon State Board of Social Protection mirrored a broader trend as the word eugenics became increasingly derogatory. One often reads or hears that eugenics became politically untenable once the Second World War had ended and the Nazi concentration camps were exposed. But we find eugenic language and initiatives common in the United States through the 1950s and well into the 1960s. It's really not until the 1960s that the word eugenics began to acquire its negative connotations. While the specter of Nazi atrocities loomed large, it was the civil rights movement and increasing concern over patient and inmate rights that made eugenics derogatory for most Americans. In the 1950s and 60s, we see people moving away from the term eugenics in a number of places. For example, we see several journals who change their names. For example, the Annals of, the, of Eugenics changed to the Annals of Human Genetics, Eugenics Quarterly to Social Biology, 1968, and Eugenics Review to the Journal of Biosocial Science in 1969. Even the most prominent American eugenics organization changed its name. The American Eugenics Society changed to the Society for the Study of Social Biology in 1973. The end of state-sponsored sterilization came in Oregon, not until 1983, when the state legislature abolished the Oregon State Board of Social Protection. This was, a, was motivated by several recent court cases which had outlawed involuntary sterilization. And the 1983 law looks totally different from anything we've seen before. For example, it read that the, the Legislative Assembly finds and declares that sterilization procedures are highly intrusive, generally irreversible, and represent potentially permanent and highly significant consequences for individuals incapable of giving informed consent. This is a completely different vein of thought also said that the Legislative Assembly recognizes that certain legal safeguards are required to prevent indiscriminate and unnecessary sterilization of such individuals. The 1983 legislature abolished the State Board of Social Protection and officially abolished the only avenue for the state to coercively sterilize any resident of any state institution. Expanding beyond the boundaries of Oregon, let me now take a look at eugenics in a national context so that we can better understand what happened in Oregon, why it happened, and how it happened. Broadly conceived, eugenics was a very popular movement in the United States. It lasted from shortly after the turn of the century until about the 1960s, and it reached its peak in the 30s in most places, but it hung around well into the 80s and others. As both a scientific discipline and a socio-political activity, Eugenics was an attempt to take control of human evolution by discovering and applying biological knowledge. In practice, it's an incredibly varied activity, but there are some commonalities that tie all eugenics movements together. For example, all eugenics movements place a premium on greater good at the expense of individual human rights. That meant that present day actions would be justified on the basis of future generations. Secondly, all eugenics movements borrowed authority from biological or social sciences. This is my favorite example of it. This is called the Eugenics Tree. It's a publication from the Eugenic Records Office at Cold Spring Harbor, which is a scientific research lab. It demonstrates the argument that in its application, eugenics drew from sciences as varied as genetics, geology, archaeology, economics, sociology, medicine, and surgery. In the question and answer, I can talk about some of these if, if you're interested in how archaeology could possibly work its way in. It actually is an important part of um, 
of eugenics or any of these others that you find interesting. Third, we found that eugenics was a very progressive activity. Progressive in that sought to replace inefficient chance and disorganization with rational, controlled measures that would speed along social progress. Eugenics was part of a broader American progressive movement, and it was often championed alongside temperance, women's suffrage, and political reforms. Finally, most eugenicists talk about the two phases of eugenics, positive eugenics and negative eugenics. Now, these are not my terms again, as you can see from the scare quotes around them. I'm not identifying one sort of eugenics as good eugenics and another kind of eugenics as bad eugenics. Rather, as you'll see, positive and negative refer to the types of actions that they, um, that they correspond to. Positive eugenics consisted of attempts to increase the number of high quality individuals. This was generally done through education by explaining to well-educated and middle-class citizens that they had a social and a biological obligation to produce more children. By and large, the people who were spoken to were people like you, college students. Negative eugenics, on the other hand, consisted of attempts to decrease the number of low-quality individuals. This was done in two ways. First, you could limit the number of low-quality individuals by limiting immigration into the, into, into the country, especially from those people who were considered low quality. I'm sure many of you know about the Emergency Immigration Acts uh, that were passed in the United States from 1920 to 1924. These acts limited the number of immigrants that could legally enter the United States. There were few, if any, uh, legal roadblocks to numbers of people who were entering the United States before this. One of the most popular rationales for these acts was eugenic. Legislatures and other proponents argued that high quality immigrants had long ago entered the United States and all that was left in Europe and other places were these low quality immigrants that were being pushed out. Um, the first people who had come over, um, the existing people's ancestors, those people had come over because their personal initiative had drawn them to the United States. Um, the people who were arriving at the turn of the century, they said, were these low quality immigrants who were being pushed out of their country and had no place else to go. So eugenics in the United States said that people would do well to keep these immigrants out. It would keep the American blood of a higher quality. Now the fact that the current immigrants consisted mostly of Eastern European Jews and Irish and Italian Catholics most certainly motivated these claims. The second negative eugenic measure was to limit the reproduction of existing low quality people in a given country. Now this is what I've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. This is where eugenic sterilization comes in. You can limit the number of low quality people in your country by stopping those people who are you consider low quality from reproducing. This was done by discouraging them. And discouraging is a very euphemistic term. It included a broad spectrum of activities. You could discourage people by family planning efforts. My favorite example of the family planning efforts that went on at this time were called fitter family contests. They were held at Midwestern and there were two in Oregon at state fairs, uh, mostly in the 1920s and the 1930s. Families would come to the state fair and they would fill out these eugenic survey forms and the forms would be judged by eugenic experts who would award medals to the people who came from the fittest families. Um, the medals that they handed out, um, it's a very common one. It's, a, um, it's sort of Greek looking parents uh, standing up and kneeling down and handing this torch to a child. And then across the top it says, yay, I have a goodly heritage. Um, these are really common. I've seen dozens and dozens of these. They're, they're around quite a bit. These contests were, were held to sort of celebrate high quality families. They were also held to try and encourage young men and women to think about the people that they married, to think about their own hereditary traits and the hereditary traits of their potential mates. A second way to discourage people is through the use of birth control. But birth control is really problematic because the people who were most likely to use birth control were people like you, middle class, educated. The same people that eugenicists wanted to encourage to have more children. So they considered it a, a double-edged sword, and they, eugenicists generally did not link up with birth control advocates. A third way was voluntary sterilization of the people that were deemed unfit. You could encourage them to start, have become sterilized. Um, voluntary, of course, is a difficult term. We see examples in this talk of prisoners being offered parole in exchange for sterilization. We've got other examples of 
um, welfare checks held up by churches and by um, state officials until the family was sterilized. Another way of doing this through marriage laws. Marriage laws were very popular, and the idea was to prevent unwise marriages from happening in the first place. Dr. Owens Adair, in addition to champion sterilization laws, was a firm believer in marriage laws. The idea was that a prospective couple would have to present themselves before some sort of eugenic authority who would approve the license. Otherwise, they couldn't get married. And of course, then they couldn't have children. Um, the next way would be institutionalization. It was a common method to keep unfit people from reproducing. You just keep them segregated, especially if you've got uh, gender segregated institutions. Of course, this also creates some problems, like what we've seen with the state penitentiary and the rampant sodomy that was going on there. The next is involuntary sterilization. Eugenicists considered involuntary sterilization as a permanent form of segregation. And they often describe sterilization as a way to permanently segregate bad germ cells from future generations. The last way is through execution. It's the ultimate form of eugenic segregation. In the United States, eugenics at one time or another has motivated all of these except the last one. I have never seen a serious statement by any public authority claiming that a group of individuals should be executed in order to keep them from reproducing their kind. There has been, however, a great many statements made by public authorities that the undesirable people should be sterilized, either voluntarily or against their will. By 1913, 22 of the 50 US states had introduced sterilization measures. With the exception of Texas, every one of these states was above the Mason-Dixon line. By 1922, 15 states had adopted eugenic sterilization laws, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Oregon being one of them, and by the time the United States entered the Second World War, we have records of at least 38,000 Americans being sterilized. About 58% of them were women and 42% men. But honestly, it's difficult to ascertain the total number of Americans sterilized under eugenic sterilization laws, as many sterilizations were not reported. The best guesses I have seen are about 100,000 people in the 20th century have been sterilized in the United States. There are some very interesting variations from state to state. For example, California is by far the leader in sterilizations, both in total numbers and when viewed by capita. Other states with large numbers of sterilizations, especially when you take into account the state population, are Minnesota, Oregon, South Dakota, Vermont, Virginia, and Nebraska. Throughout the course of the 20th century, the trend of sterilization shifts. It begins on the West Coast and on the Midwest. Throughout the 30s and 40s, it becomes increasingly popular in the Northeast. And then through the 50s and 60s, it shifts to the South. Viewed in the national context, Oregon's history of eugenic sterilization is quite average. The state was among the earliest proponents of eugenics, and it was spearheaded by political uh, progressive social leaders. And it peaked in the 1930s and slowly faded from the 1940s through the 1960s. Broadening to examine eugenics in the international context, we find that there are eugenics movements in every industrialized country in the world and in many developing countries. It was strongest in Western Europe and in the United States, but there are also eugenic movements in the Soviet Union, Latin America, Japan, and China. Only recently have historians assembled case histories of various eugenics movements, and they're starting to make comparisons. In doing so, they've found all sorts of interesting things. For example, in some places, like in Oregon, eugenics was used to justify involuntary sterilization of criminals, homosexuals, and rapists. Ed Larson has described how, in the American South, eugenics was employed to sterilize poor whites as part of a broader movement to purify the white race. Nancy Gallagher and Kevin Dam have both examined eugenic surveys that were conducted of rural Vermont and rural New York, and they argued that eugenic surveys were part of a larger movement to clean up the environment by getting these low-quality people off the land so that the land would more closely reflect their Arcadian images of what it should look like. Nancy Lowe Steppen discovered a very different situation in Latin America. Eugenicists and race were completely different there. In Latin America, eugenicists actually celebrated and promoted diversity with their claims. In Europe, as I need not tell you, 
eugenics legitimized sterilizations, euthanasia and genocide, all of which have been well documented by historians. Collectively, historians have offered several explanations for the widespread popularity of eugenics during the 20th century. Some emphasize the incredible successes of the biological sciences, which included the creation of new agricultural products, medical advances, and the increasing popularity of evolutionary science. Other historians have placed eugenics into a broader movement that was evident from the 19th century on to naturalize social prejudices. In this way, proponents of eugenics used scientific language and authority to emphasize the qualitative difference between groups of people. And it's in this context that eugenics is so closely linked with Nazi racial hygiene. More recently, James Scott has considered eugenics as part of a broader 20th century movement that he calls high modernism, in which bureaucrats envisioned a sweeping rational engineering of all aspects of social life in order to improve the human condition. In his definition of high modernism, Scott includes everything from the industrial efficiency of Henry Ford and Frederick Taylor through large-scale agriculture and eugenics to Stalin and Hitler. Scott's concept of high modernism is an attempt to attack what's come to be called the Enlightenment Project. Dr. Allen spoke about this on Monday a little bit. And to attack modernism generally. Certainly, as, as we heard on Monday, modernism and the Holocaust are interrelated. And most historians have seen strong connections between eugenics, progressivism, modernism, and the Enlightenment Project. Let me now conclude. As I said earlier, it's difficult to determine pr precisely how many people were eugenically sterilized in Oregon. I estimate that between 1909 and 1983, somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 men and women were sterilized in the state. About two-thirds of them were women. Women made up the majority of the population in mental health institutions, and they were more commonly sterilized there. Whereas in prisons, men were much more common and therefore made, the, made up the bulk of the criminals who were sterilized. By today's standards, it's difficult to consider many of these sterilizations voluntary in nature. For example, take a look at Governor Martin's plan to offer con convicts parole in exchange for sterilization. It's clearly coercive, and today it would not be considered voluntary. But in its day, it was a very progressive move and a great way to relieve overcrowding in jails without subjecting the public to any additional danger. Underlying all eugenic measures, both positive and negative eugenics, was the notion that complex social and political problems were ultimately located on some physiological structure. Therefore, the solutions to these complex problems could be found only when the offending biological structure was located and eradicated. This line of thinking is especially attractive to two groups of people, and we see them in the Oregon story and in the national story, too. The first group are bureaucrats. Bureaucrats loved eugenics because eugenic solutions were quick, inexpensive, and guaranteed to work. The offending organ is in the trash. It's not going to be a social problem any longer. Second group of people who really liked eugenics and really pushed it were biologists and medical doctors both of whom found in eugenics a way to increase their professional standing because they could use eugenics to demonstrate to the public and to social leaders that their very unique knowledge could provide the solution to these complex social problems. By the late 1960s, we see a substantial shift in the Oregonian's opinion about eugenics and eugenic sterilization. And the 1983 law contains quite aggressive speech about the problems with sterilization legislation. While the word eugenics has very obvious negative connotations today, many of the underlying assumptions that drove the eugenics movement are still alive and well. For example, recent debates over welfare reform have exposed some of these assumptions. Look at welfare reform in New Jersey and Wisconsin during the 90s, where mothers on welfare were given financial incentives to not have additional children. We also hear echoes of the eugenics language in concerns about the Human Genome Project, and uh, in the debates over sociobiology. In the context of Holocaust Memorial Week, the history of eugenics has a number of lessons. Most often discussed is its connection to Nazi racial hygiene. But I think we also need to look at less riveting, still very worrisome applications of biological knowledge and biological metaphors to social and political problems. Looking specifically at eugenics in Oregon, we see how various social, scientific and political influences combined to bring about the forced sterilization of thousands of Oregonians. 
These influences stress the importance of rational planning, control, and efficiency in order to speed along social progress. And these factors were clearly motivated both great and small atrocities. But I'd like to argue tonight that these factors also limited their potency and their lifespan in the United States. For example, oops. let's take a look at the list of discouragements from family planning through execution. If you remember, I said that I had never heard an authoritative American source claim that execution was a viable tool for eugenics. Why is it that Americans stopped at involuntary sterilization? Certainly, German eugenicists did not stop at involuntary sterilization. What created this line for Americans? Why did they stop? I'd like to conclude tonight by arguing that the same progressive ideals that motivated the eugenics movement created this line. Ideals that arose from the Enlightenment project, most notably rational planning, controlled government systems, systems that were created by checks and balances that limited Oregonian eugenics throughout the 20th century and eventually brought it to the end. Rational planned systems, including gubernatorial oversight and veto, popular referendum, and judicial review. Moreover, Enlightenment ideals of civil rights, common sense, and concerns about the tyranny of the majority created a rigid boundary that stopped American eugenics from executing the citizens that they deemed unfit. Eugenic aspirations in Oregon and in the rest of this country were held in check by both constitutional and commonly held ethical beliefs. Nonetheless, Americans, Oregonians included, walked right up to the edge of this line. Thank you.